Welcome everyone to this um, non-performing loan day second edition Ukrainian session. Uh, many thanks to our distinguished panelists uh, for joining us and it is my pleasure to moderate this session devoted to non-performing loans in Ukraine. Uh, we have an indeed uh, great list of panelists and um, uh, I would like to um, just uh, provide the word to uh, Pavlo, uh, he's the first one in my list. Uh, could you please introduce yourself and just provide a few bullet points about yourself? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, since April 2019, I have been appointed as a head of Problematic Assets Division in National Bank of Ukraine. And uh, since that moment, I'm responsible for driving recovery activities for non-performing stabilization loans granted by NBU to uh, commercial banks that were recognized as insolvent and currently uh, are under liquidation process. Uh, prior to that, um, over 10 years experience in uh, distressed uh, NPLs assets, uh, risk and uh, SME banking in Provex Bank of Intesa San Paolo Group and to Eurobank EFG. Uh, there, I was responsible for debt recovery, NPL portfolios, uh, sales, and uh, debt restructuring. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you. Alexei, could you please step in and tell about a few words about yourself? Uh, hi, uh, hi everyone. My name is Alexei Sobarev. I'm a director for Prozor.Sale, where a uh, state-owned uh, enterprise. Uh, and a platform for transparent auctions. Uh, one of the areas being uh, assets of the failed banks, non-performing loans, but also insolvency and all the regular commercial auctions. So through our platform since 2016, uh, we already sold around 14 billion grivnas of uh, non-performing loans. And that involves the as the assets of the DGF, uh, the banks that, that are in liquidation, so the assets of the commercial banks that just use the platform as a marketplace for trading NPLs. Thank you. Um, Gifford, could you tell uh, about yourself, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Gifford West. I'm a managing director at DedEx. We're an international loan sale advisor and loan sale platform. Uh, we've been in Ukraine for five years now, working with the DGF, conducting sales. We've conducted two successful sales and have three underway. Thank you. Thank you. Olga? Hi, everyone. Uh, I am uh, representing Deposit Guarantee Fund of Ukraine. Actually, I have over 20 years experience in banking and started with credit crediting and lending until the first crisis in 2009. And since then I'm focusing on non-performing loans, restructuring, recovery, and general management. I am with uh, DGF already for uh, three and a half years. And uh, now I'm deputy managing director and uh, responsible for the liquidation of the banks and uh, uh, sales and management of all NPL else the bad banks have on their accounts. Actually, DGF during the last um, three to four years was the main supplier of non-performing loans in the Ukrainian market. And actually, uh, Prazora platform was uh, created together with DGF to ensure the open and transparent sales procedure for the non-performing loans and other assets of the bankruptcy banks. So, um, we have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge about the local market. Thank you, Olga. Um, dear Ariane, could you please uh, now finally introduce yourself? Sure, Andrew. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Ariane Giorgio. I am the global head for the Distress Assets uh, Investment Platform and in IFC. IFC, uh, for those that don't know, it's International Finance Corporation, which is the arm of the World Bank that does investments in the private sector. Uh, in distressed assets, we have uh, globally more than 7 billion allocated uh, investments across uh, asset classes, uh, from corporate to retail. Um, and um, out of this 7 billion part, we have mobilized uh, with co-investors, and uh, 2.5 billion is our own account. Uh, 
uh, prior being the global head of a distressed asset platform. I was responsible for our uh, portfolio uh, in Latin America for financial institutions uh, and also uh, for and prior to that, I was responsible for our investments uh, in the financial sector in South Asia. Thank you. Thank you. And also, as we have Alexander, could you also please introduce yourself? Mm. Hi, everybody. My name is Alexander Chernik, and uh, uh, I'm a head of uh, uh, out of court debt settlement unit, uh, and uh, I'm responsible uh, of. Uh, uh, unit of uh, Ukraxim Bank. Uh, it's a state, uh, this is a state bank. Uh, and uh, I'm responsible here uh, for the out of court debt settlement and uh, financial restructuring, Implement implementation of the, of the law or about the financial restructuring uh, within the corporate clients and uh, individual business. My mission is. Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to how to say to build uh, to create uh, the system here, uh, which could help uh, also uh, to sell the uh, uh, right of claims and uh, uh, some uh, specific assets. Well, I mean, problem assets. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so I will finally introduce myself. So my name is Andrei Chernus. I'm counsel and head of the commercial dispute resolution practice at Hillman uh, Partners, Ukrainian British law firm, where we also largely involved in dealing with uh, non-performing loans. And uh, we have um, advised both state companies and uh, state banks and uh, private entities. Uh, and um, Having, having done all introductions, it could be seen that among our panelists, there are representatives both from the regulator side, this National Bank and the Deposit Guarantee Fund, State Bank, and um, worldwide uh, investment fund. So we have a really strong team to discuss the, the, both the current state of affairs in terms of the NPL market in Ukraine, and, and uh, also discuss uh, some of the challenges and changes in the regulatory framework that uh, uh, that happened in Ukraine for, for the last year, and uh, also from after that, give some useful advice and practical insight for potential investors in NPL. And uh, I would like to start from basically commenting um, on the Ukrainians' um, existing situation in terms of NPL. So, Ukrainian non-performing loan market is quite large and diversified. 54.1% uh, of all corporate uh, loans and 35.3% of all consumer loans are non-performing. And um, this is um, quite an interesting diversification. And um, you know, it would also would be interesting to hear um, the panelists' opinion about the reasons and uh, impacts of such um, uh, diversified market and also discuss uh, how, is it, how it feels uh, in terms of the uh, COVID, um, how it, uh, whether it impacts or not on the borrowers and how banks are dealing with it. So um, I think I would like to give initial words to uh, Olga. So um, how, how do you feel from the part of the um, GF? How is it going? Thank you, Andy. Uh, actually, this high uh, ratios of NPL portfolio is a historical one, actually. It is concentrated most in the state-owned banks now, and it is represented by the old loans, mostly corporate and, and uh, private mortgages that are under moratorium already for 10 years, actually. Uh, so uh, concerning um, uh, COVID changes, uh, there are, of course, NPLs that are um, uh, the, re the main reason for that are economical uh, decline that we experience here in Ukraine also. But um, the uh, share of it, of this new NPL, is not so sufficient, I would say. And it's majority the private individuals. At the same time, we know that a lot of corporate customers already applied to the bank for uh, receiving restructuring or some waivers for repayment during this um, 
uh, difficult period. At the same time, we as a um, deposit insurance institution, we analyze also the resource base and we see that the deposits in the banking system, the resources of the private individuals and the legal entities, they are increasing and we can constitute almost 400 million grievances increase or 20% compared to the um, uh, beginning uh, of the year or the period before the quarantine. We uh, did not, we, the GF as a seller of MPLs, we did not uh, stop uh, our sales or our activities with regards to the non-performing loans, not for one day actually. Uh, the sales platform is online and it's fully operational and investors can apply and make a guarantee um, deposit online as well as we as a supplier we put all the information to the system online so it uh, allowed us not to stop sales and we actually didn't experience any changes in the results i mean the prices we expected the prices to decline uh, due to economic decline and due to shortage of the liquidity, but uh, we uh, saw that only in the first uh, couple of weeks, like two weeks or three weeks in uh, March and in April, and afterwards the prices of the market fully recovered and the, the uh, sales price also recovered, uh, maybe because uh, this year was the year of final sales of DGF. So we um, we prepared all the investors to the fact that this that will be this year will be the latest five year of our sales, and that's why we are not going to um, extend it for the next year. So you buy now or never. So this this was our point that we explained in advance to the investors. And uh, we did not ex experience um, a decrease in prices. Uh, however, prices in the market for our NPL remain very attractive. I would say very sexy, uh, sexy because uh, mm, the level of one, two, or five percent on mortgage, private mortgage loans, this is a very uh, attractive level. So uh, we do not uh, see any uh, crucial instability in the banking activities. We have only one bank that was uh, failed and uh, it became into liquidation this year. And this was a small bank that didn't play a big role to the market uh, crediting or deposit market. So generally the system, the banking system was uh, prepared and uh, well communicated the situation to the clients, both for the borrowers and for the depositors. So these high levels of the MPLs that we see, they are mostly historical. They, they would slightly increase due to new economic obstacles um, and circumstances, but uh, DGF uh, will not produce uh, so much assets for the buyers as it was previously. We almost finished our sales and now our successful auctions, they are counted in like thousands of dollars every week. So it's very, very small uh, amount. And um, I think that in this situation, our state-owned banks that are now owner the, of the, the largest part of the NPLs of the market that they will make use of this um, hot markets of these investors that are interesting in our interested in our country and will make the next steps to full the uh, proposal to the market thank you thank you so uh, as i understood there is certain upstream of sales uh, in terms of mpls right on the market uh, we had uh, very old NPLs in the liquidated banks and we have sold them almost all. So we do not expect newcomers to us in a huge volume. Of course, there will be a couple of banks that will uh, always become bankrupt in uh, even um, in the good economic conditions uh, due to different reasons. But uh, we as a supplier of the um, bad loans, we uh, will not continue to play the same role in the uh, nearest future. We have very few 
to stock of the NPLs. I see. Thank you. Uh, so you started t talking about the um, uh, new supplies of uh, troubled assets from state-owned banks. So it would be probably interesting to hear the opinion of uh, Alexander as the representative of Ukraxin uh, Bank as a state-owned bank. Uh, so Alexander, what uh, do you think about the further sales of uh, NPLs by state-owned banks? Uh, hi everyone again, and uh, <laughs> what we can say. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, our team is just uh, pulling up uh, all the procedures uh, and uh, um, regulatory framework uh, which uh, could uh, help us uh, uh, to make the uh, sale process uh, crystal and uh, um, understandable uh, for uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, uh, we uh, propose uh, uh, and we assume that we will make all the, uh, all the sales uh, within the Prozoro uh, platform or uh, some platforms like the Detex or uh, foreign, uh, foreign, foreign platforms uh, such as Detex and First Financial Network, uh, for example. And uh, we just uh, we have uh, the act uh, of uh, you know, the resolution of the Cabinet uh, Minister of Ukraine number two hundred and eighty one. But uh, it is hard to uh, how to say to implement uh, nowadays, and uh, we just on our way. And uh, I think that we need just a, a little more time. Uh, for example, um, half a year will be enough, I guess. Uh, you will uh, see all our uh, NPLs uh, portfolio, which we uh, put uh, on the market uh, next year, I guess, uh, uh, and. Uh, we just uh, in a position when we collect uh, all our NPLs uh, assets, uh, well, I mean the collateral, and uh, next year we will uh, make the, uh, how to say, the, the process of sale, of the sales, of sales, uh, yes, uh, uh, within the Prozoro platform. Uh, if we're talking uh, about uh, some kind of uh, restructuring, uh, yes, we, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, some big cases, uh, but uh, you see that uh, the crisis uh, is on its way, and uh, I think that uh, uh, we will we will have uh, uh, our job in the next year because uh, you see it's hard to uh, make some uh, estimations, even if you have. Uh, a good uh, system and uh, your procedure inside the bank uh, allows you uh, to make all the restructuring and the, uh, I think that uh, the only way, the, the only right way uh, of uh, NPLs with the DPD over uh, five years, six years uh, or a cases uh, which is in the bankruptcy, failed in bankruptcy, uh, uh, it's uh, the right way uh, to make the sale uh, the right of claims or the sale or collateral sale uh, with, with the same uh, Prozoro, uh, Prozoro platform. And uh, you see that a lot of uh, borrowers, they are, how to say, they are afraid, uh, will be the good word, uh, of the uh, sale of uh, its, uh, of, uh, I would say, collateral base. Uh, uh, on the Prozora system because uh, uh, they they got no any opportunity uh, to how to say to um, to fail to fail the sale process and uh, I think with the help of uh, Prozora sale it will be it will be more effective uh, if we are talking about uh, bankruptcy cases uh, so this is it. Perhaps you have some questions. Yeah, thank you. I actually just want to make a comment that you mentioned the um, resolution of the Cabinet of Ministers uh, 281. 
dated mm -hmm. 15 April 2020. I just want to comment that this is uh, the uh, resolution that allowed uh, sales of uh, NPLs by state-owned banks because there were no particular uh, procedure before that, before the 15th of April. And now it is allowed to state-owned banks to sell um, and their NPLs with greater leverage of the price, although there are some risks we, which we will discuss um, a little bit further. Uh, um, well, you see that, uh, uh, two more words, uh, that uh, uh, for the state-owned banks, uh, uh, cabinet ministers, it's like a shareholder, but uh, we have the national bank as uh, uh, the main regulator of our of our uh, activity, and uh, we waiting for uh, from uh, their side uh, some recommendations or uh, some kind of instructions, further instructions how to uh, implement and to. to uh, uh, um, to take uh, the right decision for the asset sale. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I think it uh, would be logical just to uh, give the word to Pavlo as a representative of National Bank of Ukraine. What do you think of the current state of uh, NPL in Ukraine and uh, what are your general observations? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, NBU is familiar with NPL from its own experience. Since we have our own NPL, and uh, as of today, it's almost 40 billion grivnias. Therefore, the NBU is um, actively working towards reducing the existing NPL and preventing its um, occurrence in the future. So, about a year ago, the NBU introduced new requirements for all of banks to work with problem loans and uh, established a clear uh, 14 months deadline for implementation of such requirements. The new requirements are set out uh, in the regulation on uh, organizing the process of managing problem assets in Ukrainian banks. And uh, the document suggests, first of all, all of banks must have implemented early warning system, which will early respond to potential problem assets and they manage. Establish the specifics of managing the uh, recovered property. As example, requires a clear plan for the storage of uh, such property uh, which uh, will be repossessed and its sale. And the third indicates to develop a strategy for managing distressed assets. Uh, in addition, I would like to um, uh, commend this uh, Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine uh, resolution. Yes, true. Now, it's really uh, important and uh, very good that we have it already on the board. But as far as I know, since today, uh, even one deal was not signed uh, according to this resolution. It means that banks, uh, the main NPL of Ukraine, are concentrated in state banks as of today. And um, so far, uh, banks are waiting, waiting who will be the first. Uh, I mean the state banks, uh, Privat Bank, uh, Oshad Bank, and Ukraxim uh, Bank. And it's very good to hear, uh, to hear here that um, Ukraxim Bank is uh, in process and hopefully they will do it and uh, it will be started. Started, I mean, the massive sales of uh, NPLs, uh, the remaining NPLs in Ukraine. Yeah, thank you. I, I may only suppose that the reason why they are not so not so eager to start selling their NPLs is because state-owned banks are really cautious about the compliance of um, the procedure and there is criminal responsibility for um, any violations in terms of uh, state-owned property. So, yeah, maybe um, Alexander would like to add something. <laughs> What go would like at something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, so we just uh, <laughs> how to say uh, we are on its way. So currently, uh, as I said, uh, we just uh, how to say gathered uh, and collect uh, all the liquid uh, uh, assets, uh, uh, which uh, have, uh, it's. Uh, 
uh, additional value for the bank. And we which, uh, uh, we will try to sell it next year. Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, the collateral, uh, but uh, if uh, we are talking about uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the right of claims, uh, it's, uh, um, I would say, it's a very difficult question. And I guess I, um, I'm not interested uh, for this uh, because uh, uh, the decision makers, uh, they have uh, uh, their own plans. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, when we, uh, when we, I would say, um, make, uh, we will make some um, pilot cases. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we will, uh, how to say, um, um, we will try to uh, we will try to uh, make this uh, uh, sale uh, crystal uh, for the market and uh, uh, clear for everyone. And uh, after that, we will make uh, uh, the portfolio assumption, portfolio assumptions and evaluations, uh, and uh, uh, estimate all potentials. Uh, uh, discounts, uh, I guess, and uh, uh, only after that, uh, uh, if we'll have uh, our um, uh, 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 the decision from the board, and uh, after that, we will uh, place to the market all the cases. But I guess that it will be uh, not earlier than uh, uh, first or second quarter of next year. But we have some plans, and we 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 are just uh, on our way, and uh, the process is uh, running. And I guess uh, that uh, uh, we will share the market. Thank you. Uh, okay, just now Olga wanted to add, and after Olga, I just wanted to would like to also hear the opinion of um, Gifford and Ariane in terms of their international view of Ukraine. So, yeah, please, Olga. Actually, uh, I would like to ask a question, and this will be like an addition, I, I hope. <laughs> and this is a question for Alexei, actually, and for Ariana as an investor. Actually, we all spoke about this new regulation of the Cabinet of Ministry that allows state-owned banks to sell. We have four state-owned banks. Three of them uh, has, have a big stock of NPLs, and three state-owned banks on their own discuss and try to develop the procedure for auctions for their NPLs. The question is whether three banks will be able to establish the same procedures of the auctions, the same terms and conditions of the auctions, or they will have three different approaches and make three different types of the auctions at Prazora. This is the first question. And the, sec the second, does it really matter for the investors to have this unified approach? Or if they, three, they will have three different, that will be also okay for the investors and they will um, cope with uh, this difference and uh, that will be not, uh, that will doesn't impact on, on the price and on uh, other decisions, whether to step in and to, um, say, to, to examine all the opportunities. Um, sh should oh, I answer? Ahead, ahead. Or, or we... Okay, um, so uh, I think that the, uh, from our point of view of, of preserved sale, um, we feel that uh, the, the banks are not discussing with us like different procedures. Uh, they they kind of use the platform and as I understand that they are looking for best practice, uh, whatever works, because uh, whatever is working is okay for the investors. So. It means that uh, that uh, 
they, they will be more secure with that and the prices will be higher, I guess. So the, the main thing is that there would be no arbitrage opportunities. And I guess we close that uh, when the insolvency market, like uh, when, when the debtor becomes insolvent and then tries to sell the, the assets, uh, it, it came to the preserved sale. So basically the debtor doesn't have this opportunity of arbitrage between different types of systems. So that's important and that's been taken care of. Um, so I guess it, the, the process themselves would probably differ within the banks themselves, but the like auction process, I, I guess would be uh, pretty much similar, but we would have to see at, at how it goes. So um, we, we all expect, I guess, that the uh, Ukraxin bank would become the first one um, to, uh, to, to start selling non-performing loans. And uh, maybe other banks would see that this is working and they uh, would just follow suit. So uh, this is sort of specifically addressing the uh, Olga's uh, question uh, rather than my sort of more broader comments. Uh, investors like some form of standardization and Prozoro, FFN, DEDX all provide that standardization, they also provide that transparency, which is critical. In terms of um, making for a more liquid market, getting as much standardization as you can in terms of the NDAs and the asset sale agreement early on in the process uh, helps in terms of liquidity. Uh, similarly, to the extent that due diligence, obviously Prozoro has a standard due diligence process, DEDX has a standard due, due diligence process, FFN has one as well. And so the, in terms of the format, as long as you're only talking about three different um, processes, uh, buyers will adapt. Uh, what you don't wanna see is every bank having a completely different process, a different platform, different rules, uh, because it will, become, it will become a barrier towards uh, international investors entering the market. Uh, those are my specific comments on that topic. Just to add what uh, already has been said, I think in the end, I mean, on auctions, I think I, I couldn't agree more with it. but just to give IFC's perspective, uh, in the end, I mean, we, the way that we set up our investments globally, we do have uh, co-investors with us and we'll also rely on partnerships that are those that are actually gonna serve the debt. We are not the ones actually doing the service of the debt, we, we partner. And, um, and again, across asset class, right? Could be corporates, but also in retails, in retail uh, portfolios. At this point uh, where we are looking at the Ukraine, actually Ukraine, as Olga said in the beginning, um, COVID, it's, it's adding to the price, right? I mean, it has been uh, first you had 2008, 2009, you had 2014, 15, um, and now you have a second, uh, a third wave of crisis, actually it's a global one, again, the same format of 08, 09, uh, but certainly with consequence uh, across the globe. Uh, what we see in Ukraine as of now, since 2015, is that there is a, a, an evolution in, in regulatory framework, which is positive. And we've been monitoring. Um, we are at this stage assessing again, trying to understand the best way to actually uh, enter the market. Uh, when we think about uh, international investors, even if you invest locally, um, we need to make sure that uh, there is uh, structures that we can invest, uh, taking the direct uh, risk of the assets, right? I mean, and, and in Ukraine as of now, it's not still so clear for us what would be the best way to do it. We leverage on SPV structures where um, we can segregate the portfolios, um, we can uh, have cross collateralization uh, we can uh, participate or not, whether uh, we have co-investors with us, we have different type of risks being taken in, a, in an STV from a debt to equity, but in the end, you, you, you segregate the portfolios from the servicing capacity. Uh, very common uh, in Ukraine is to have uh, the FINCOs, uh, especially in, in retail, and we particularly, we don't uh, think that uh, that's the best way to attract investors to actually take corporate risk. 
so that's something that we really, really uh, try to avoid. Besides that, what we've been uh, monitoring is that, uh, um, well, you need to have more uh, best, uh, let's say, tax, non tax side. I mean, how can you be more efficient uh, so that you ally certain uh, structures vis a vis the others? Investors want to have lean structures, right? When you can actually be. Um, you're, you're not, uh, your investment form is not tailored by the tax per se, right? Uh, or if you make it burden as a costly structure, you're actually gonna scatter um, investors. Um, others uh, going to the commonplace, it is to have, uh, of course, once you go to the need of an enforcement of collateral, so we need to make sure that it actually this is global regardless where, whether you are local investor or not. Uh, in a, another important point that we are also monitoring is the um, uh, best practice in collections. Uh, let's when we talk about distressed assets and we are a development institution. For us, yes, there is the economic uh, component um, of the investment per se, but there is also um, the impact. And on the impact side, uh, best practice uh, also comes along because you cannot uh, just buy a portfolio and then having uh, your name associated to a bad practice, right? I mean, collections, uh, the way that they are done in a proper way, it is really important for us. And that's something that we, we work closely with our partners globally to ensure that uh, it is implemented, right? We don't want to be received with, uh, with um, you know, an approach that could be, uh, you know, this is a more of a negative or, uh, just pure aggressive uh, vulture type of investors we, we, because that's not what we are, right? We are uh, responsible investors. Thanks. Ariana, you actually mentioned that you keep a close eye on the re regulatory changes in Ukraine. So uh, it would be interesting to hear what you think of the um, existing procedures of uh, selling NPLs. So do you find them transparent and um, easy or they are um, like quite burdening for investors? So Andrew, this is something that uh, for us, we're still uh, analyzing to, to really, we are not at that stage yet. As I said uh, to you earlier on, I think for us at this point, um, we're still really at the stage that uh, we're struggling to come up with uh, a structure that will be viable for us. As I said, I mean, that goes before the assessment because that's actually, when you think about the procedures and uh, we'll come to this as we, we are in a state to actually go for the investment. At this point, uh, first we need to make, make sure that uh, to set up our uh, vehicles, it's actually something that will be viable for us. So we've seen some uh, improvements um there's still uh we hear that there is still uh, a challenge in validity, in validity of collaterals of uh, and uh, registration and so on and so forth um but at this point i don't think it will be uh reasonable for me to actually to comment on on how um how like let's say reliable it is the process i, I think there are others in this uh, conference that will be in a better position to say as they are market participants. I, we are not a participant yet, um, but hopefully it will be one day. And, uh, but we're in actually in the early stage. And again, one thing that we look very importantly, because I think here we cannot lose sight, um, although a lot of uh, the corporate, or most of the corporate that is that the, the heavy burden, but many, uh, most of the times when we enter a market, we enter, uh, in the retail side on the consumer lending. And that I see that there is a, a, a progress that has been done recently, which I think uh, for the best practice, which for us is really important to have the regulator with us, to, you know, I mean, with us as investors, right? I mean, that then knowing that the regulator is also monitoring concern about um, the good implementation of uh, collection practice. Andre, can I jump in? Yeah, please give her. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, your point is, is very good. And I think 
given our perspective uh, of having been in Ukraine for five years now, uh, we can't forget how the, the hard work that Olga and Pavla's agencies have done and they individually have done in terms of getting to where we are right now in terms of setting the groundwork and the underlying um, infrastructure so that NPL sales can happen. And I think that the Ukraine government has gone in the right direction in terms of transparency and trying to set a, a, a fair level playing field for all investors through Prozoro, DEDX, FFN and the like, uh, rather than bilateral sales, which are rife to uh, accusations that they aren't being done fairly and that people are being excluded. I think the impact of COVID uh, speaks to the, the strength of the work that uh, the DGF had already done because we were engaged to conduct a sale and executed a sale after the declaration of the pandemic and that was successful. We've started on a second one uh, in the past few weeks. Um, the process having been set, it was relatively streamlined and the banks that were in liquidation had their due diligence material all uh, pretty much in pretty good order. So there's a lot of heavy lifting that's already been done. I think in terms of international versus local, the impact of COVID is interesting because pre-COVID, there wasn't a lot of European NPLs um, to choose between. And that was part of what we were doing in terms of marketing the Ukrainian NPL market to international investors was, here's an opportunity. There are not a lot of opportunities in Northern Europe. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, the ECB is estimating that there could be 1.3 trillion euros of NPLs in Western Europe. So this is going to make it more challenging for Ukraine to um, compete. And so as the state-owned banks come into this market, the, uh, they're going to have to bear in mind that their, the international investors are going to be looking at a lot of different markets and they're going to have to make the process as streamlined as possible for people to make an initial assessment as to the opportunities. Um, and that, I think, speaks to Olga's question about the same processes and the like. Um, and similarly to Ariane's uh, comment about the need for an easy way to set up a vehicle. So it, I guess I would summarize this all by saying in terms of the current market, you're going to have assets that are going to appeal to local buyers and um, uh, that's less important as to what platform and vehicle you're using to try and market those. But for chunky assets where you think an international investor would be bringing in know-how or capital, uh, it's important that the sales be structured to make them as easy as possible for the large and international investors who have the capital to invest those and the know-how can easily access them. So a lot of thoughts, very few words or too many words. That's it. Thanks, Giver. So yeah, I agree that um, the best solution for to find as much as possible investors is to make the process and the platforms for selling uh, MPL through auctions as uh, seamless as possible. So um, it would be interesting to hear the thoughts of um, Alexei. What do you think of the further advancements in this regard? So, yeah, please. Um, we, we see that the platform uh, becoming uh, like a standard for commercial sector here. We already had a couple of commercial banks uh, like Raiffeisen, Alpha Bank, uh, OTP, uh, using the platform for their NPL sales uh when while the dgf uh, sales are dropping so there is actually an active uh, uh, active npl market and also some of the buyers of uh, of dgf npls they kind of either collect part of that and then repackage the rest and try to use the platform as a vehicle for sale or um yeah or, or, or they like repackage uh, through various lots or maybe add some extra NPLs on top, uh, which they bought from other parts of the market uh, and sell them through the platform. So we see that activity there. But uh, on average, the COVID didn't actually uh, decrease the activity. 
I, I completely agree with what Olga said that uh, there was a, a slight slump uh, for a week or two where the people were just into uh, working online versus offline, but afterwards, like th the demand is there. And what we see from other areas uh, like the real estate, the privatization, um, there is a demand for risk during the time of COVID inside Ukraine. So, um, um, and I guess uh, like when, when state-owned banks or uh, anyone else wants to sell the, the MPLs right now, there will be buyers, uh, especially if uh, the market rates uh, there are uh, attractive. Um, so I think that the, uh, the, the effect of COVID was actually beneficial uh, for, uh, for participants in the market. Uh, and also like the current market situation where the uh, deposit rates of the banks are falling and the people are uh, become like uh, more uh, risk, uh, uh, they, they looking for more risk, I would say, right? Because of the uh, of decreasing deposit rates uh, that also plays uh, to the better NPL sales. I see. Thank you. So um, as far as understood and as I, as I see it myself, the market is actually quite booming because there are uh, every day new and new uh, auctions of uh, NPLs uh, being announced. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's uh, crucial, important to um, simplify the procedure as much as possible and in particular keep a focus on the procedures that are being um, developed by state-owned banks uh, and the regulators. So um, what, what was already discussed is that um, this uh, guidelines for state-owned banks uh, are already being um, actively implemented. And as uh, Alexander mentioned, they most likely will be implemented uh, in the second of, of in the first or second quarter of next year um, but um, anyway looking forward that um, it would be as soon as possible and the state-owned banks will actually start selling NPLs and the NPL market will only benefit from it. So I uh, basically we discussed the um, uh, current states, the state of affairs in the NPL market in Ukraine and uh, I would like to move to general recommendations to potential investors um, and um, what could what our participants panel panelists can advise them to uh, look at when making their decision and uh, some possible legal pet pitfalls in terms of purchasing the NPLs. So um, Olga, maybe you would like to comment something. Yes, thank you. Maybe I would start. Um, actually, we have a great experience of uh, cooperation of our buy with buyers after the deal is uh, closed. And uh, I can definitely mention that the first, actually, we are selling the NPLs as it is. So we propose to examine all the existing information. We are open, we can share all the documents on paper or in virtual data room, but the idea is that investor will look at them very uh, attentively and um, make a sort of analysis. Because after the deal is closed, we do not accept any claims and uh, um, say proposals to, to <laughs> take them back. So this is our rule, and I think that the state-owned bank will follow us on that. So there will be no opportunity to make a restitution. And therefore, when you pay money, you should make a very, very good due diligence to understand what are you paying for. This is our uh, main advice and maybe the main let's say, uh, understanding of uh, uh, our types of deals. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Pablo, maybe you would also like to uh, give some advice to potential investors. Actually, I will not uh, add something new and uh, I am fully uh, share Olga's uh, opinion and her advice. The due diligence is 
uh, I would say number one uh, criteria after the price. That's it. Thanks. Um, so I also would like to also give words to um, Gifford. So uh, maybe from your practice, you can advise something uh, particular in terms of due diligence or choosing an NPL, because we, we all agree that the pre-deal due diligence is, if, is of utmost importance. Uh, however, we should also keep an eye on um some particular things when making a due diligence for instance we should look in terms of ukrainian realities we should look into the um, uh, borrower's profile on his links and uh, properly assess all uh, legal and regulatory risks definitely i i think the advice to investors especially international investors is you've got to uh, there are, there are real opportunities in Ukraine, but in the time frame of a sale, you're not going to be able to do your initial legwork uh, at, at the same time as you're conducting your due diligence. So if you think you're going to be investing in Ukraine, if you think that some of these opportunities that are going to be coming out of the state-owned banks and the DGF are, are real, uh, you need to talk to your lawyer and you need to talk to local partners before the auction is announced. So that there's a so that you've already done your legwork because there is no way you're going to participate in a sale without having already engaged local counsel and possibly having worked with a local partner, because the the terrain in Ukraine is different and there's a lot of obstacles and you just referenced one the the borrower uh, you know the borrower standing with uh, within Ukraine is a, a critical factor to consider in terms of your due diligence before you look through at the the, the nuts and bolts or, or bricks and mortar of the underlying asset. Due diligence is still pretty much the physical due diligence is actually still very similar to every other country, but the legal due diligence is something that you don't want to skimp on. And, but I think there's exciting opportunities in the next two or three years, especially as the state owned banks um, I start selling because there are some real, really very interesting opportunities for international investors in that space. Thank you. Yeah, I fully agree that in terms of price competitiveness, Ukraine is um, extremely um, effective in terms of uh, NPLs. And um, I also agree in terms of the necessity of uh, proper legal due diligence in terms of Ukraine and realities, because um, not, not sure about other countries, but uh, in Ukraine, when purchasing an NPL, you should be extremely cautious in terms of uh, all possible um, litigations, arbitrations uh, in Ukraine or, um, or abroad, because it uh, will also, uh, but it could also potentially impact on uh, on the purchase. Um, for instance, from our practice, you should also uh, consider the risk that the, the auction would be challenged by the debtor, which uh, simply would not like to just um, loss, lose uh, an asset. Particularly if it's uh, really price prideful. Uh, another thing that should be considered that's the um, possibility of a real collection, uh, because um, although the, the um, NPLs for um, either for monetary demand or or, or for um, collateral assets, but uh, you should also consider the risk that uh, there could be litigations. For, for years and years. And because unfortunately, Ukrainian national courts are quite um, overloaded. And uh, it also depends on whether, um, on, on how much proceedings there would be, and how many. And because um, it also could be the case when uh, one case proceeding can just suspend um, or immobilize another case. And you will have to wait years and years until um the there will be final resolution uh, so yeah it is uh, crucial important to understand the um, the time the possible time frames yeah olga i noticed you wanted to add something please yes i'm sorry i want to say something again <laughs> actually we have the experience of appealing the auctions and the uh, selling by dgf to a new creditors and this practice is now quite 
wide. We have a lot of a lot of first youth on that impact. Of course, borrowers do not like that they have now new creditors and they need to repay the debts. So litigation continues, and this is one of the part. But until now, then the majority of such litigations are not in favor of the borrowers. They are in favor of the DGF and the new creditors. And DGF did and will do uh, everything possible to support the investors and uh, to support these new creditors and uh, help them with the documentations and with the opinions, with everything possible, because we will always be on the side of these uh, new creditors. And once again, uh, until now, there are no new, no, no negative um, decisions that came into force on the results um, of, of the um, of the successful auctions when we closed the deal. Yes, and the uh, court made a decision to uh, cancel it. So currently, practice is. Uh, positive in favor of the new creditors. Yeah, thanks. I also would like to make a point that the practice is in favor of uh, corporate um, investors, although in terms of um, domestic or consumer loans, there could be some risks. Um, for instance, there could be some uh, registration of children and it's a, a serious obstacle, so it should be duly analyzed if there is a property, uh, immovable, immovable property, and um, a children was registered there, it's uh, his or her uh, place of residence. And it's uh, also um, uh, the thing that is also quite often used by borrowers in terms of challenging the um, NPL sales, particularly the, the children rights. So this also definitely should be taken into consideration. Yeah. So, um, in terms of also um, some general advices, maybe um, Alexei from the preserve sale standpoint can advise something also. Um, well, I would say that the uh, the, the standards of uh, selling non performing loans and preserve sale are well known to the market participants, and I guess uh, both in Ukraine and abroad. Uh, the ones that are interested in Ukraine, they all heard about that. Uh, what what I'd like to draw attention to is that uh, the market is changing throughout the last year uh, because uh, one big shift has been uh, the new uh, code on insolvency. And because the last mile of the insolvency, uh, the asset sale um, has been shifted towards uh, preserve sale procedures, it, uh, we see that during the last three months, the market actually started using the auctions, meaning that uh, like uh, people already understand that it, it is you either paid your debtors or you will face the same procedure as uh, uh, the bank would sell your loan. So that put the debtors into more favorable position so what uh, prices and models worked a year ago should probably work now only then um, the debtor would be more secure i guess like to what extent i don't know but can uh, uh, the situation to debtor has improved over the last year yeah thanks i also fully agree with this and also wanted to make a point that uh, Everyone basically mentioned that the, the importance of a proper due diligence of the pre, pre deal due diligence. And also I would like to emphasize um, emphasize the importance of the um, post deal um, cleansing of assets. So even if the due diligence of before the deal was duly conducted, um, even the, um, the most, uh, the cleanest and the most Temptingly looking um, NPLs could start bringing some problems when they are purchased and when the borrower became aware of the change of the credit, uh, it may start just um, initiating uh, or litigations or even criminal proceedings. Uh, unfortunately, dishonest bor borrowers also try to uh, abuse their procedural rights by commencing um, all sorts of uh, actions, although they are. Uh, as correctly Olga mentioned, almost always are unsuccessful, but the, the main purpose of borrowers is just to 
just to cause some troubles, procedural troubles for the new creditor and to take some additional time. Although there are also um, different, different procedural remedies that could be used to, um, to tackle such um, dishonest behavior of borrowers. Yes, correct. But usually, actually, all these risks and time already are priced in. Yeah, so this is uh, basically the price of the discount that is um, very attractive and competitive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so maybe um, someone else would like to give some final advice or comments. Um, Alexander? Yeah, uh, I just want to say that uh, the market has a uh, different uh, consumer demand and uh, we will try uh, to satisfy uh, this NPL demand. Uh, follow for our advertising in upcoming uh, two months uh, and we will have the pilot project uh, within the uh, a sale of the right of claim uh, uh, of uh, loan agreement. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting case. Follow for our advertising and uh, <laughs> good luck for the winner. Yep. Yeah, we will Thank definitely keep, keep a close eye on it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Ariane, I noticed that you were raising your hand. Maybe you would like to also add something. Sure. First of all, Andrew, thank you again for the invitation and um, very interesting to listen to all your perspectives. And uh, but uh, again, I think it's really important to emphasize that uh, these structures are also very important. And going what uh, Gifford said about uh, local due diligence, local partnerships, the legal framework. But at, prior to that, there is this structure, and I think. Um, onshore and offshore and across asset class. I mean, treating differently corporate and retails, it's, it's, I mean, I know that there's the onshore investment fund with AMC that you can consider for corporates, but uh, that will be very important that the city will have an equal treatment for, for retail NPLs as well. Uh, the same when you think about uh, the onshore, offshore, uh, if you want to broaden the investment base for Ukraine, and especially when you think about uh, a moment with, uh, heavy supply of NPLs. But once again, thank you so much. Thank you, Rani. So I guess um, everyone just gave their advice. So um, I basically just would like to thank you, um, dear participants, for um, sharing your thoughts, your uh, ideas and uh, insightful uh, advice. So uh, thank you for joining and for uh, sharing your experience. And um, I hope that our uh, viewers would uh, enjoy from watching our uh, session. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>